Yeah, there's no doubt about um, Fanny's, Fanny Crosby's hymns. There are really so many beautiful ones there that we should all uh, listen to it from time to time. You can get them all on YouTube, you know. You just turn it on and you'll hear some incredible choir singing uh, some of those hymns. Oh, and of course, you've got Charles Wesley as well, Isaac Watts. There's quite a few of them around who write, have written beautiful hymns. I think from that the last um, 30 or 40 years we've tended to sing a more chorus style of things, but I think hymns are coming back. Anyway, I want to read now from 2 Corinthians 11, and I'll be reading... Really great, that is. Problem with this uh, electronic stuff, it's good when it works, but if you give it a wrong knock, you're in trouble. Anyway, 2 Corinthians 11, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, that seems to be the popular one around these days. And Paul is writing to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do, not, do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere pure and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge, indeed. In every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. May the Lord bless to us that reading from his word. I don't know if you remember back to a time when we had radios, that was one of our main forms of entertainment, and there was something called shortwave radio. I don't know if any of you listened to it. I listened to it occasionally and I can remember picking up uh, Radio Japan, Radio Peking, Voice of America, and I even picked up uh, South Africa one day. There was a program in the, uh, late in the afternoon, I heard it was called Good Morning Africa, and it went up to through the uh, various parts of Africa, from South Africa. It's probably quite a good program, but I didn't get to hear much of it because it the, the um, signal was very faint. But there's one shortwave station that you might have heard of. It was called HCJB, the Voice of the Andes. It's a Christian radio, it was a Christian radio station, and I listened to quite a few Christian programs on it. I tried to get it on the internet last night, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I think there, were probably, there are probably two people in the congregation who would have understood it, but I couldn't. That was the voice of the Andes. And there was one program I remember listening to, and the, the preacher there was, called it Word Keys Which Unlock Scripture. Now he would take a word from the scriptures and examine it a little closely and go through the scriptures and talk about what it meant. And I want to do something of that this morning when I look at a particular word. I'll tell you what the word is in a moment. But I want to go now to Exodus. We read in Exodus 25, it's, it's just the verse that I've got here. 
20 verse 5, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now that's our text for this morning. And I'll repeat it. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. The reference is to idols that they were not to bow down to. We will not be considering the section, the second part of the verse, on how disobedience might affect future generations, except to say <coughs> that our actions always have consequences, and that is asserted in the verse. It may not just be us who are affected when there is disobedience, it may be those who are as yet unborn, but this morning we will put that to one side. When we think of idols, we usually think of some sort of statue, or as the Bible says, a graven image. Perhaps a grotesque statue, maybe carved from rock. Perhaps like the, something we might see in Mayan or Aztec ruins in Central America, in Hindu or Buddhist temples, even perhaps in Easter Island, something like that. I think it needs to be understood that it is not so much the structure itself, the graven image that is, even though that's bad enough, but what is behind the worship of that idol. What was the mindset of those worshippers who choose to focus their worship on the, the sort of cult as was the worship of the Canaanites? What were they thinking? Because that was, would have been what Moses had in mind when he was putting these words to paper or papyrus or whatever he did. The Canaanite religious cult entailed debauchery, evil, including temple prostitution, child sacrifice, body mutilation, among other things. That was the real danger that the children of Israel would be caught up in what the Canaanites were doing. The reformer, John Calvin, said that the human mind is a perpetual forge of idols. The French philosopher Voltaire said, God made man in his image, and ever since, man has tried to return the compliment. Think about it. <laughs> Voltaire was not even a believer. Pascal, who was a believer, said much the same thing. That is the nature of human sin. We are constantly being drawn away, being drawn away from the truth and into sin. Even the most grotesque of sins. The children of Israel were a classic case of this. Always going off into some other sin. As it says in Exodus 32, 9, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Apparently, they simply don't want to do what the Lord commands. Elsewhere in Isaiah 50 and Jeremiah 3, we have recorded the propensity of God's people to go their own way. Straight to the point, the prophets say, play the harlot. The prophets were repeatedly speaking against such trends. What I want to concentrate and focus on this morning is that word which seems out of place when we consider our Heavenly Father. That word is jealous and we will try to see where it fits into God's dealings with his people and we will try to bring our thoughts on God's jealousy through the New Testament up to the present. 
I always thought, and you possibly thought the same thing, it was strange to say that the Lord, the creator of the universe, could be described as jealous. What, why would he be jealous? When we talk about jealousy, we mostly understand it to be a negative thing, something we ought not to be or do. Being jealous is to be envious of others because we believe we should be receiving more and better and we are not getting our fair share. Who hasn't heard their kids call out, Hey, that's not fair! Being jealous is something we ought not to be. It may involve persons, some nearby persons in our lives, maybe family members, work colleagues, being resentful of the advantage that others appeared to receive. There is much in scriptures, in the scriptures that warns against such jealousy. Our Lord is not pleased with it. The following verses are really talking about the sin of jealousy. Here are some verses. Proverbs 14.30 A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. James 3, 16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. And yet, here we have the scriptures ascribing jealousy to our Heavenly Father. How can that be so? But what we need to understand is that there is another kind of jealousy. And we read about it in the passage that we read just before. Being that other kind of jealous may at times be the right thing to be. If you have responsibility for someone, if you know of someone who's at a disadvantage and they are missing out on something that others are getting, maybe you should be jealous for them. <coughs> in Acts 6, 1 we read, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So that would be a case where jealousy probably would be fine. In the other verse, in 2 Corinthians, I mentioned previously, Paul writes of this other kind of jealousy where he is jealous, whereby he is jealous for the Corinthians with whom he has had a special relationship. He said, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Paul, as an apostle, has clearly put a lot of work into the Corinthian church, but they have walked away from that or are in the process of doing so. Notice that he compares the behaviour of the Corinthian believers to the behaviour of an unfaithful life. And speaking of unfaithful wives, we are immediately reminded of Hosea, in the Old Testament who loves his wife even though she has been unfaithful. Yes, God is the loving spouse who loves in spite of our transgressions. And turning that around, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 22-33 that the marital covenant resembles that of Christ and his church. Men are advised to love their wives as Christ the, loved the church. He gave himself for the church and so men are supposed to love their wives enough to die for them. Just make sure you've got the insurance payments up to date before you do. <laughs> the Corinthian church and the Lord 
had lost that intimacy of relationship and reduced the relationship to something legalistic. Paul has reason to be jealous. What the Corinthians have done is build up within Paul a bitter disappointment and he describes that as jealousy. This is probably what we mean when we say our God is a jealous God. He has done so much for humankind, investing so much of himself, giving us life, giving us his son and dying, who died for us, giving us salvation through Jesus Christ. And the sad part is that many hear the gospel and even seem to respond to it. Take it they take it so casually and even walk away from it. And haven't we seen much of that in recent years? People not putting their heart and soul into serving the Lord, doing as little as possible and often not doing anything at all, walking away from him. It may be people we care about very much, yet they still walk away. They may be from our family and after much praying for them and encouraging them, they still don't take up following the Lord, but head off in other directions. I'm sure many of us have seen that. Behind all this, this move away from the Lord is something we all know only too well. It is sin. We are faced with sin on a daily basis. A sinful world was not in what was intended in the beginning. It was our original parents, Adam and Eve, who sinned and thereby have bequeathed to humanity a state of being in sin. Sin is something we have to deal with. <coughs> Paul says in Romans 6.12, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. We are all sinners. We continue that departure from obedience to God and into a sinful state started by Adam and Eve and we grieve God's spirit. The scriptures are full of, of examples of people who walk away from following the Lord, including much of Israel over the time from the settlement of Canaan right through to the Babylonian captivity and beyond, although the Bible does not record past then. When the children of Israel had come out of Egypt after crossing the Red Sea, what did the children of Israel do? They built a golden calf, yes, a pagan idol. After that spectacular de deliverance from Pharaoh and all that was involved in crossing the Red Sea, they can turn around and build an idol. What can you make of that? We read in the Judges about this cycle of disobedience getting into trouble, and God rescuing them from by the use of a judge such as Gideon, Ehud, Jephthah, and Jair, J-A-I-R. All we know about Jair is that he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. That's all we know about him. Even the kings of Israel like David and Solomon, they went astray. Just think of David when he committed adultery and also Solomon when he took foreign wives. They knew they weren't supposed to do that. But the message of scriptures is that all attempts for humankind to make it on their own by ignoring God are futile. We are dead in trespasses and sin, as Paul says in Ephesians 2.1. But there was a plan of salvation, a plan for reversing what had happened in the Garden of Eden, a plan for us all that will draw us back to him to ultimately arrive at the original intention that God had in creating us. This plan of salvation, which is adequately described in scripture, has been called by German theologians, Heilsgeschichte, salvation history. It's a term that is well used by theologians. We could begin our investigation of Heilsgeschichte or 
salvation history in the Garden of Eden where mankind first fell into sin. Our Lord points to a future time when the serpent or Satan will receive his just deserts. The seed of the woman, that is the descendant, will crush the serpent. This is the first covenant. It is a promise of a future happening, a future salvation. In Genesis 3.15, this is what the Lord has to say to Satan. And the Lord, there will be war between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. By him will your head be crushed, and by you his foot will be wounded. After this, after, and there had been that first covenant recorded. Sometimes this covenant is called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. <coughs> the first gospel statement of the gospel. He will bruise your, uh, he will crush your head, even if you bruise his heel. Yes, it might be a little vague as to what is intended, but it's clear that right will prevail out of the contest between the seed of the woman and Satan. The Lord indicates that it might be costly with bruising and crushing, but in the end, the Lord will win. As we move through the scriptures, and Genesis in particular, we see a covenant between God and Abraham, where God calls Abraham and makes certain promises. We read about this promise in Genesis chapters 12, 22, and 28. I will quote from Genesis 28. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. And we know that the offspring is none other than our Lord. Even though when God speaks to Abraham, the birth of our Lord and Saviour in Bethlehem is still over a thousand years away. The next unfolding of the covenant and plan of salvation for Israel after they cross the Red Sea, when the children of Israel are stranded there in the Sinai Desert. Their leader, Moses, is directed by God in this project. Moses is given the Sinai covenant by our Heavenly Father to guide the people in the right direction as they enter and settle the Promised Land. The covenant is often called the Law of Moses as well as the Sinai Covenant. We think of laws as something of a straitjacket and restricting us, but in fact the Law of Moses was given as a guide and teaching us so the children of Israel could move forward with confidence that the Lord was going with them. Not all those rules were meant to be permanently permanent, particularly as the New Testament would come into being. Somewhere, some were limiting existing practices. But when I say a guide, I don't mean they could just ignore it as, well, just some maybe some helpful advice. They were to take it seriously. <coughs> there are indeed some unusual and strange rules to our way of thinking in the Sinai Covenant. God's people are told to avoid pork, shellfish, crustaceans, and not to wear mixed fa fabric. Can you imagine not being allowed to eat pork and, and um, prawn cutlets? Wouldn't be very nice. Anyway, that was their rules. There are special ceremonial rules and the sacrificial system is set up to atone for their sins and the sins of the community. There are moral rules concerning things like murder, theft, lying and adultery that we most instinctively know are wrong anyway. And these moral laws are still in force and largely applicable, to, applicable today. We know that by God's grace, all humanity knows that. They can kid themselves, but they, but they all know that certain things are wrong. We just do. But our brain, our, we can make excuses for lots of things. But even while the law of Moses was still in force, a new covenant and a Messiah are foreshadowed in later prophecies and writings in the Old Testament. 
are chosen some. In Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the agreement which I will make to the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inner parts, writing it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. A prediction of the new covenant. In Isaiah 42, 6, I the Lord have called you to, in righteousness. I will take your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. And that's what the church is. And that's what the mission of the early apostles was to be a light to the Gentiles. And it still is. We are meant to be a light to the world around. That's why we go to places like Bangladesh and goodness knows where else we go. Another one is a covenant thing. It is written about all through the Old Testament. The Lord via the prophet Micah in 5.2 gives some further details. Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, our, right, our Lord, our righteousness. The writer to the Hebrews provides an insight into the place of the law in the new covenant. The law is only a shadow of good things that are coming, not the realities. For this reason it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw nigh to worship. We no longer need those things because Christ suffered for us. As Hebrews 10.10 10 says, we have been made holy through the fact sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The covenant has been drawn up for our benefit, the benefit of our people. And that, I put it to you, is why we say that our God is a jealous God. He wants us to follow his word. He's jealous for the truth that he puts out. He wants you to get a hold of it and live by it. The things that he has put in scriptures are there to teach us and we're meant to study them carefully and learn more about them. The Lord says, our Lord says, Father, sanctify them by your truth because your word is truth. In whom, and that's in John 17, 17, Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you, you, having been given the true word, the good news of your salvation through your faith in him, were given the sign of the Holy Spirit of hope. The Holy Spirit works through the word. That's why we preach the word. That's why we have Bible studies. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit, they are life. Peter says that we need to be ready to give an account of the hope that is within us. We must understand that hope and that means understanding what the Lord has done for us and how that love for us develops through in the Old Testament leading on to the new covenant in Christ's blood. There are those out there who would tear us down. They love to go to the Sinai covenant and pick out the most strange stipulations and use them as a tool for mocking us. We counter that by understanding what is going on. The Lord is consistent in his dealings with us. He wants us to do what is right and he has provided you, uh, a guide for us. Yes, he is a jealous God. He doesn't tell us what to do, but he wants us to do and it grieves him when we ignore him and walk away from him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that comes through and help us to understand it and help us to live by it, we pray. Go with us now, we pray, as we ponder these things in Jesus' name. Amen.